Well, hello, everyone. My name's Josh Sidvari. I'm the Geospatial Information Librarian at Ohio State, um, one of the member institutions for the BTAA Geospatial Information Network. <clears throat> I um, am going to be introducing our keynote speaker today, um, Katie McDonough, who's going to be speaking about reading maps, making, searching, and interpreting text on maps. Um, before I do that, I'll just go over a couple of quick logistical items. As, as Karen mentioned, during the welcome, um, the Q&A feature is enabled in the webinar. So feel free to add questions for Katie throughout um, the presentation. Um, we'll have about 15 to 20 minutes at the end to go through some of those questions and I'll, I'll be facilitating that. So hopefully we'll be able to get to your, your questions. Um, Katie has also shared a number of links with me um, that I'll be sharing throughout the presentation in the chat. Um, so keep an eye on that as well. So you'll, you'll be able to get links by the chat. And if you have questions, you can go ahead and put them in the Q&A. And with that, I will go ahead and introduce Katie um, so we can get started with the keynote. Dr. Katie McDonough is a lecturer in digital humanities at Lancaster University and recently a member of the Living with Machines Project and UKPI of Machines Reading Maps. She works at the intersection of social and intellectual history and the history of science and technology. She uses computational methods to translate large collections of 18th and 19th century European texts and images, maps in particular, into data that historians can interpret. Her current projects explore enlightenment discourses of geographic knowledge, the politics of highway construction in rural France, and the impact of railway infrastructure on 19th century British, com British communities. At the Alan Turing Institute, she chairs the Computer Vision for Digital Heritage Special Interest Groups. So thanks, Katie, so much for agreeing to be our keynote today. We're really looking forward to this presentation, and I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Josh. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to be yeah, speaking about the Machines Reading Maps project that, uh, that Josh uh, just briefly introduced. And I, I just want to begin, first and foremost, by, by saying that this was uh, an incredibly collaborative project. I think you're going to be hearing from some of the colleagues that I'm going to introduce uh, now who are based at the University of Minnesota, so uh, Big Ten colleagues. Uh, later in in a in a demo of one of the one of the tools uh, that uh, I'll just briefly introduce in this talk, um, we were a transatlantic collaboration funded both by the NEH in the U.S. and the AHRC, uh, which is the kind of uh, peer institution of the NEH in the U.K. Uh, alongside myself in the U.K. Uh, based team, uh, we worked with Reiner uh, Simon, who's actually based in Vienna. Uh, who is originally the developer of Recogito, a well-known annotation interface, and Valeria Vitale, who um, uh, was formerly at the Turing uh, with me, but is now at the University of she Sheffield, and Valeria is also uh, a specialist in digital humanities. On the U.S. side of the team, uh, we had Deborah Holmes Wong, uh, who is at the Digital Library at the University of Southern California, uh, Professor Yayi Chang, who leads the Knowledge Computing Lab at Minnesota, and his PhD students, uh, Zakun Lee and Gina Kim, uh, as well as actually a number of other PhD students who joined the project later on in the collaboration that we did with David Rumsey. Um, uh, if you head over to their uh, GitHub resources, which those links will come up shortly, you'll see the whole team and all of the incredible uh, work that those students did. Great. So I just want to dive right in by really asking why we were interested in looking at text on maps. So um, Machines Reading Maps as a project uh, came together because of a, of a previous interest that uh, Yao Yi Chang and, and Deborah Holmes Wong had in figuring out how to create methods for working with text on maps and a sort of uh, in parallel development of an interest that uh, on the Living with Machines project uh, that I was a part of at the Turing for exploring a range of different kinds of content on maps. Uh, and we really realized that we had the shared interest and, and the timing of this call from the AHRC and the NEH could not have uh, been more fortuitous. 
Uh, so as you can see here on the on the left in this detail of a of a map uh, from the Ordnance Survey collection, text is really everywhere on maps, uh, and there's been a lot of focus on other kinds of information. Uh, for example, uh, building footprints in terms of automatic processing of maps. At least that was true a few years ago. Text is catching on uh, because of uh, the sort of um, uh, explosion in, in methods that are making it easier to work with uh, complex historical documents. Um, but in 20, 2019, 2020, when we were putting this project together, uh, neither of the teams that were coming together for machines reading maps had a sort of really good uh, tools that were going to be accessible to the communities of people who might want to work with text on maps, namely librarians uh, and humanity scholars who are interested in historical geographical information. Um, so text was a challenging kind of data that we wanted to be able to uh, create machine readable data sets of. And as you can see here on the right, we had a lot of maps potentially with which we could work. Uh, and so an important element of the Machines Reading Maps project was our collaboration with cultural heritage partners. Initially, these were uh, the National Library of Scotland, um, where we wanted to, to work particularly with their digitized ordnance survey collections, the Library of Congress, where uh, as we were writing this grant, the Sanborn fire insurance map sheets were coming out of pop copyright into the public domain. So it was a very exciting chance to begin working experimentally with those. And uh, we were also uh, meant to work with the Ordnance Survey collections at the British Library, which largely have not been digitized, but which are increasingly um, kind of in small batches being digitized. Uh, and so alongside the NLS collections are a really crucial source of um, potential information in the future uh, about Ordnance Survey. And then finally, as I'll talk about later, uh, we had this really wonderful opportunity uh, to collaborate with the David Rumsey Historical Map Collection which of course uh, is affiliated with uh, the, the Rumsey Map Center at Stanford Libraries. Um, David Rumsey uh, kindly funded uh, an additional project on top of the grant, which made it possible for us to process uh, about half of his collection uh, using tools from Machines Reading Maps. Um, so what is Machines Reading Maps? It's really a, a workflow that contains lots of steps and multiple tools. Uh, so I tend to talk about the Machines Reading Maps toolkit uh, and workflow as a way to think holistically about how we get from preparing uh, scanned historical maps to having data uh, that we can work with in a variety of contexts, whether that's a research context or uh, in a library or sort of glam context where we want to improve discoverability, for example. So first you can see here, there's obviously always a lot of questions about how do we actually prepare images and metadata where that metadata exists to uh, run through uh, any kind of uh, computational process. Uh, we were exceptionally lucky to work with collections uh, where there was a lot of expertise on the library side to help us with that with that data preparation. And of course, the team at Minnesota who was developing Map Curator, which have, was the tool for processing and creating these uh, text on maps data sets, uh, was also doing a lot of work behind the scenes to, to prepare those images and, and metadata. So Map Curator is the uh, computer vision machine learning pipeline uh, that allows uh, us to create one GeoJSON file per map, which contains the all of the text on that map, its pixel coordinates. If the map is geo-referenced, we also get geo geospatial coordinates uh, and some other information that's also created during, during the process. I'll, I'll say more about that later. We also had a really important part of the project uh, focused on annotation of maps. Uh, initially, uh, the aim for thinking about annotation was really to create training and evaluation data or gold standard data for uh, use uh, by map curator, right? To create training data uh, through which the models could uh, uh, be trained on, on data annotated by humans uh, or to evaluate the results of map curator uh, through 
very high quality kind of um, expert curated um, annotations of the text on maps content that we're interested in. So this is the reason that we were working with Reiner and I'm gonna talk in a minute about the Recogito platform. We also ended up uh, developing a couple of different approaches really to thinking about annotation. On, on the one hand, we wanted it to be a kind of helper tool for the machine learning uh, aspects of the project. But we also really wanted to emphasize that it was really crucial to have um, a kind of interplay between the automatic methods for creating text on maps data and the potential for simply wanting to manually annotate data uh, in and of itself, right? And uh, my colleague Valeria often talks about this as like the small data approach to annotation. Uh, so we wanted tools that allowed us to kind of move back and forth across the spectrum from big to small. We wanted the kinds of data, the formats and the standards that we were using for annotation to also be um, uh, sort of uh, cross-referenceable across uh, this, this kind of scale from, from large to small. Really exciting project that emerged from this uh, focus on annotation was actually embedding some of the features of Map Curator in the Recogito annotation interface itself. And I think that Josh is, Josh is going to share the link for the bespoke Recogito for Maps interface that we created, uh, at which you're welcome to sign up and use. It just runs on a VM, which will be live for at least a few more months. And um, there's uh, tutorials which can walk you through how to use it either purely for manual annotation or with this kind of map curator uh, features uh, that, are, that are available. With the David Rumsey collection, we were able to really explore uh, the next aspect of the workflow, which was how do we kind of search, right? How do we explore the data? Uh, that is created with Map Curator. Uh, and we did this uh, through a close collaboration with the Luna team um, based in California. Um, you're gonna see some of the results of, of that work uh, uh, later in the presentation. And then finally, uh, we needed to sort of start learning how to analyze this data, how to evaluate it. And of course, it really importantly, how to share it, right? So we had this real emphasis on doing our work in the open, sharing data as quickly as possible, sharing code um, as quickly as possible. Uh, and I think you're gonna uh, also be, be seeing a number of the links towards um, uh, the code and, and data, which is still coming out, uh, but uh, it's really exciting that we're making this available to the broader community. All right, so I'm gonna talk about different aspects of this workflow and the tools through the kinds of experiments that we were doing with our cultural heritage partners before I move on to talking about how we're uh, working with the data. So uh, our early experiments were really focused on the kind of annotation, sharing, searching, and beginning to, to analyze uh, the data. Uh, first, we were uh, we undertook a really wonderful uh, sort of experiment with the National Library of Scotland to crowdsource text on maps and to collect gold standard data with the Library of Congress. Um, in terms of sharing, this was something that we explored largely with the Library of Congress uh, and the David Rumsey collection. Through search, as I mentioned earlier, this was uh, something we were able to do really with the Rumsey collection because, um, you know, as you can all appreciate as um, uh, people who are sort of quite familiar for something like the GeoPortal tools, uh, changing a library search interface uh, is very hard to do. Uh, we were able to work with David Rumsey and the Luna team to do this in a way that was quite uh, sort of agile and quick. Uh, and very exciting to prototype what it might look like to search this data. And then finally, uh, we have a piece of active work on uh, researching antiquities and on 19th century British maps. We have a, a, a couple of articles uh, that are exploring that in the works right now. I'm gonna talk about um, the uh, analysis of the Rumsey data uh, rather than the antiquities project. But if you're interested in that, uh, we're happy to say more uh, in the Q&A or um, yeah, stay tuned for uh, those articles. So a little bit more about these different experiments. The annotation experiment with the National Library of Scotland, uh, which was um, sort of undertook uh, with uh, the, the maps department and in particular, Chris Fleet, who is uh, a huge supporter 
of all of the work that we've been doing uh, with BAPS. Uh, we would not have uh, undertaken this particular project without him. Uh, and indeed, uh, with the community that the NLS has uh, sort of that is very excited to work on crowdsourcing projects. Um, so in about two weeks with 70 members of the public, we collected more than 30,000 annotations of text on the 25 inch, which are the largest scale OS maps just for the city of Edinburgh. And um, not only did we draw bounding boxes and uh, collect tra text transcriptions, we also uh, collected information about the semantic type of that text, because one of the real ambitions of the National Library of Scotland was to create a 19th century gazetteer of Edinburgh, where being able to distinguish between things like, is this text describing a building or is it describing a street, were incredibly important. So this data has now been released on the data foundry at the National Library of Scotland and uh, is, you know, can be put to all kinds of uses. There's a lot of documentation about how it was created there as well. Um, when it comes to the small data approach or the annotation of gold standard data, we spent a lot of time uh, developing guidelines for collecting these annotations. And this is work that uh, Valeria Vitale was really leading on because she's got such a deep background in thinking about semantic annotation of historical documents, uh, especially uh, maps and the ways that we can think about creating historical gazetteers from information like text on maps. So uh, some of the really important principles that were behind our guidelines were that we wanted to be attentive to the accurate transcription of historical text. Uh, we wanted to reuse established text annotation practices, such as you know, practices in, in diplomatics, wherever possible. And we wanted uh, to account for the computer vision task requirements, right? So we wanted to be sure that we were annotating things in ways that made sense for the kind of complexity of a humanistic understanding of the text, but we wanted to do so in a way that would make this information viable as, um, you know, training data or evaluation data for, for a CV task. So the basic tasks for the annotation included creating bounding polygons, transcribing the text within those polygons, linking the text uh, in described in those polygons to external knowledge bases, uh, such as Wikidata, uh, and tagging that text with semantic types, such as street or building. Uh, we did this, as I mentioned, with a bespoke version of Recogito uh, developed by Reiner Simon. Uh, and this was a very exciting project because Recogito has gone through a few generations of use now and actually um, is kind of uh, in the process of being um, sort of rebirthed, uh, Recogito 2.0. If you're interested in those conversations, I strongly recommend checking out um, the, the, the sort of debates and, and chats about that happening over on the Pelagios network uh, sort of community. Um, but this attempt to really think about how we could change uh, an annotation interface that wasn't necessarily developed for annotating maps, just slightly change it to really make it work well for the, the needs on machines reading maps. So on the right, you can see here that we have a, a kind of annotation interface with a, with a pop-up bo pop box. Um, and at the top, you can see there are three main types of things that you can annotate. You can annotate entities. Uh, that might be a building footprint. or You can annotate labels, which is the text that we're primarily interested in, and then symbols, which might be, be discrete objects uh, like, uh, like the, uh, the tree symbol uh, that you can see on some of these examples. You can add geotags to the external knowledge base. You can do the transcriptions. You can add tags for semantic types. One of the really exciting features that we developed here, which you can see, is that we made it possible to annotate two independent polygons, to put them in a group, and to order them. So the grouping and the ordering was a new feature that we developed on Machines Reading Maps because of the importance of being able to, to sort of capture multi-word place names, for example. Um, and, and as I mentioned earlier, Recogito for Maps integrates the text spotting functionality for Map Curator directly in this browser-based annotation interface for a kind of hybrid semi-automatic annotation experience. Uh, I just wanna say a few words about the basic semantic types. So these are really uh, a, a kind of 
uh, so shall we call it like a starter kit of semantic types that Valeria and I developed largely with the OS maps. You can see examples from the OS maps in the screenshots here. But the idea was to propose this as a kind of uh, starting place for thinking about generic ways of semantically labeling text on maps. Um, so at the top level, you can see we're reproducing those three kinds of uh, uh, sort of cartographic signs, whether that's an entity, a label, or a symbol. From the label, which is the text, we then go to level two where we ask, what kind of label is this? Is it a unique name? like Northrop, a name that identifies a city or a building or uh, perhaps an island? Is it a type of thing that's not unique, like pumping station or footpath? Or is it some other kind of text? Other is a really valuable uh, category here. At level three, we then ask, uh, what kind of object is represented by the label? Is it an area, a building, a street, a natural feature, or something else? And this really applies to all those sort of other type or unique name types of labels. And this is really where we get down to getting really valuable information about the nature of the type of things that are being named on places. Okay, so uh, what does this look like in practice? So this is, this is an example of the gold standard annotation data that we collected working with some really talented undergraduate research assistants at the University of Southern California. Um, this data, uh, as you can see, comes from a Sanborn map from the Library of Congress collections. This data uh, that the manually annotated data is going to be released openly alongside uh, a selection of map curator results for the Library of Congress, which I'll say more about uh, in a moment. Uh, we're really excited to be collaborating with the Library of Congress on this uh, project to process a sample of the Sanborn collection. So we're going to be uh, openly releasing about 10% of the Sanborn collection sheets uh, that are uh, sort of documented as uh, with text on maps. So this uh, includes California, all of Manhattan and New Orleans, and some random subsamples uh, across the entire collection. Then we have the gold standard data, which I've just shown you, uh, from about 55 uh, Sanborn sheets. And it's been really wonderful to collaborate with the Library of Congress Labs group, as well as Maps and Geography Department, to release these data sets as a kind of data, data package uh, through the Computing Cultural Heritage in the Cloud derivative sort of data set uh, uh, initiative that uh, we're going to be adding to. So the goal here was really to create some data that can be reused in any kind of context and to make this discoverable as a sort of um, tied up sort of data package through the main Library of Congress catalog rather than developing any kind of special uh, um, search interface. Now, the search is what we were able to do with the Rumsey collection. Um, and I'm sure many of you have seen this by now, but if you head over to the main David Rumsey website, um, you'll see what you see at the kind of top right here, which is a new way of searching the collection. This means that the results from the map curator uh, processing have been indexed um, uh, in the back end of the uh, sort of content management software for the Rumsey collection and are now searchable alongside regular metadata. Um, and I'm, I'm just gonna show a quick video while I kind of talk through uh, uh, some, of, uh, some of the possibilities here. Um, so we, we worked really hard with the Luna team um, uh, to, to really think about not just the way in which this data was being created and the Minnesota team did really amazing work to think about how do we handle maps that are in different languages, how are we creating training data? They did some really novel work to create synthetic training data for this corpora, uh, for, these, for, the, for this collection. And um, we worked really closely with Luna to think about how we're displaying this information. Uh, so Drake Zabriskie and David Wong uh, at Luna uh, were really behind the design and implementation of these uh, ways that you're seeing uh, the results of the map curator uh, processing display in the in the catalog interface uh, online. Uh, so here in a basic search for library, 
in the text on maps functionality, you can see all the different ways that library is appearing uh, sort of typographically on maps. You can see there's 1600 results for library. Uh, and when you hover over one of the instances, it shows you the map and you can click through to that map, see the individual instance of that annotation and click on it and engage with it. Now, if you're logged in, you have an opportunity to edit uh, the text as well as the bounding box. And you can see here uh, that it, it it's documented previous uh, instances of the data being worked on. And if I have edited it and confirm it, now I can see it's already stored the annotation you know that I made uh, to correct the capitalization of the L. Um, you can also, from the map view, uh, see the all of the text on on one map. This is going to take a minute uh, to to appear. Uh, but for this map of Portland, when you click on the sort of green line icon at the top, eventually we will see all the bounding polygons for all text on the map. And that gives you a more holistic sense of the map curator results for uh, for this map, rather than just uh, the search for one term, uh, which you can do. Um, once that data, uh, there it is. Yeah, so you can see that uh, some interesting things are happening here to kind of keep in mind. So we're obviously getting the street names and the building names, but we're also getting that information from the legend, right? Map Curator picks up on all text on the maps. And this is something that, uh, you know, is both um, sort of an advantage and something that we need to think about how we're going to work intelligently with this data. Uh, I couldn't resist here doing one more uh, sort of edit. It's quite addictive once you get started. Uh, you want to keep going. Um, so yeah, here you can see that I expanded the polygon. I made it into caps. I've confirmed it. And then I've also spotted uh, that there's a false positive. Um, so in the Rumsey collection interface, this this an beautiful annotation interface, also I should say designed by um, by Reiner, uh, you can remove false positives. You cannot, however, add entirely new polygons. That's something that's a feature we haven't turned on yet. So the really exciting thing I think, especially for librarians and for researchers, is that you can combine a search of traditional metadata with the text on maps. And you do this through the advanced search, which you're seeing on the screen now. So what I've done here is I'm saying, okay, uh, in the metadata field for country, I want, to I want to limit it to France. And then I want to search for libraries or bibliotheque uh, in the text on maps index data. And then so that sense, in that sense, I'm combining a metadata search with the text on map search, and I can see the results of that. So these are all the maps uh, that, based on the metadata, are um, sort of covering France, have coverage of France, and contain the text string for bibliotheque or library. We can click through on one of them and see the result. So this is a really exciting way for really transforming discover discoverability of cartographic collections. It allows you uh, to not sidestep metadata, but to really make metadata uh, work for you in new ways alongside uh, the index text data. All right, so I'm not going to say a lot about Map Curator because I, I think you're going to hear from the team that developed Map Curator uh, later today, but this is what Map Curator looks like. Uh, and it's it's worth saying that it's a really powerful and state-of-the-art tool. Uh, they have a number of papers coming out based on the work that they've been doing around Map Curator, uh, and, it, and it's a long-term project for the team at the Knowledge Computing Lab at Minnesota, and they're really they're really world leaders uh, in this work. Uh, uh, that's uh, where the co computer vision task is called text spotting. Um, so effectively, you take your map image, you divide it into uh, cells or patches, uh, you do a text spotting, which is a, a text detection task, and then the recognition or the OCR part on the patches, you merge the patches and those uh, detection and recognition results back together. You convert the pixel coordinate information for the polygons 
into geospatial coordinates where possible, so where you have a georeference collection. And then you can optionally also take on a few further steps. So you can see module five allows you to query knowledge bases to run a kind of post OCR task and to do an entity linking task um, if that's something that your data lends itself to. The output are GeoJSONs, one per sheet where every text annotation is a feature with different kinds of metadata. All right, so what can we do with this text on maps uh, for research? I'm gonna break this down into two parts. First, I wanna kind of take a bit of a theoretical uh, 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 sort of, um, uh, yeah, break and then look at the data itself. So uh, the first thing is just actually realizing that in, uh, in scholarship uh, in the 20th century, there's been a real lack of simply seeing the words on maps. Um, so in, in, this, uh, in a really important uh, book from 1976 called The Nature of Maps, Essays Toward Understanding Maps and Mapping, Barbara Pachetnik wrote that as quote, two systems, maps and language, they are essentially incompatible, end quote. Um, so the basis of this statement is really embedded in the question of whether maps can be read as texts. It's one of the opening salvos and what's still really an open debate, debate among historians of mapping about the status of the map and how we can study it, both as an object and as a container. So from this claim stemmed several works in which the presence of actual text on maps, as opposed to thinking of maps as a kind of uh, language, uh, was somehow ignored. Uh, across an entire literature of inquiring whether maps are language, there's little to no treatment of how to understand the part of maps that is explicitly using written language alongside other kinds of signs to communicate about located features. So with machines reading maps, we wanted to really attend to the text on maps as a fundamental element of map content in a way that somehow had never been done before. It's really something that can help us understand both the history of mapping and the history of ideas about place, a kind of cultural history approach. And it's also worth saying that there's a really kind of strong technical history of map lettering, uh, which has never connected up uh, with uh, this more uh, sort of linguistic approach to thinking about maps as, as language. And, and I, I have found this uh, divorce between these two literatures really interesting. So I'm going to propose three ways uh, that, you know, sort of bringing in uh, ideas from other scholars that we can begin to think about how we can create uh, uh, create and, and, and think with text on maps and, and give some examples of where we're headed uh, with using text on maps. So basically, the idea is that we just need to take seriously the idea that we can, in fact, read maps. Um, and I'm going to... Um, Use uh, start with this example from Joanna Drucker, uh, who's really important article uh, in from 2011, Humanities Approaches to Graphical Display, highlights that text on maps is, 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 is a kind of CAPTA, right? And this CAPTA is not, depends on the idea that knowledge is constructed, taken, and not simply given as a natural representation of pre-existing fact. And so this is really important, right, to the way that we approach maps and the text on maps, not simply as reporting things on the ground, as a, as a kind of ground truth, but as something that we need to approach uh, as, as, a, as something that's been constructed, which we need to then understand and, and, and investigate uh, as, as researchers. The second kind of key thing to hold in mind is that text on maps is part of a process. Uh, and here I'm really drawing on uh, the really excellent work uh, that Matthew Edney has done. And this is a, a quotation from his 2019 book, Cartography, the Ideal and its History. So Edney says that maps are not just graphic images or things, but are variously integrations of words, graphics, numbers, and gestures. Consideration of the myriad ways in which maps are consumed indicates that map reading is, an is as intertextual a process as any other kind of reading. Re readers require an understanding of the cultural context to interpret any map. No map can be understood except by reference to other texts and cultural forms. Maps are best understood as works in progress. And so I've really taken this on board in the way that we're thinking about how we can examine the results, for example, from Map Curator and thinking about 
contextualizing them, uh, in thinking about the relationship between words on a map to the other features, numbers, and gestures. Uh, so we don't want to think about text on maps in isolation uh, from any of that uh, uh, additional information. And finally, I think this is a really important sort of intellectual inspiration for the work, uh, is that um, we can really we can really kind of investigate meta geographical mischief. Uh, so, as Martin Lewis and Karen Wiggin asked in their 1997 book, *The Myth of Continents: A Critique of Meta Geography*, can we attempt to overcome the limits of problematic, overly taxonomic approaches to organizing geographical space by historicizing the categories through which we think about the world? So. In capturing all of the texts on maps, we suddenly have a way to investigate exactly what they're, they're asking here. We can investigate uh, sort of the way that places are named at scale across cartographic traditions, across centuries. And this is something that we've never really been able to do before. Okay. So. Now we're going to uh, think about how we can take those kinds of inspirations, those, those guide guideposts uh, for thinking about text on maps, understanding the previous scholarship to what we can do to work with, with text on maps. So the first thing we really are excited to do is to link text to semantic information. Now you saw, you've seen that we have done this manually through the crowdsourcing experiment, We've done that with our gold standard annotations. We haven't yet done that automatically in terms of automatically predicting the semantic type of a, um, any, a, a text label on a map. So that's really a next step for us. We are also excited to examine the graphical information embedded in text on maps alongside its literal information. So uh, for example, on the ordnance survey maps, this is the basis of our antiquities uh, project. We're really excited that fonts were used to distinguish between different historical periods, between Roman, pre-Roman, medieval period historical sites and archeological find sites. Um, so this graphical information is something that's really important for us to capture, but that we don't yet really have a method for. The last thing that we're excited to, to keep thinking about methodologically while embracing this kind of historiographical concerns is differentiating between text that describes a map versus the, as the French say, the, the fond du car, uh, right? The content of the map, right? The coverage of the space that it's trying to uh, describe or illustrate uh, on the ground. Uh, and this is something that um, we're gonna see has a really big uh, impact in just a moment. So um, it's really just a huge challenge to develop methods for exploring, much less analyzing this data, which is huge. Uh, the second version uh, of, of three uh, for the David Rumsey collection includes 90 uh, million text labels. And you can see these represented in here in a map where uh, you can see that the artifact of capturing uh, information that is uh, sort of, as you say, like outside the neat line of the map, the title, the metadata, right? We can see the artifacts of that in this map here. Uh, and so this, this uh, sort of important task of d distinguishing between the content of the map and shall we say the meta information about the map, describing the map as an object is something that we really need to, to work on next. That's a, that's a, technical, that's a technical problem. Um, let's break this down, you know, zoom in to, to one map. We're really excited to think, as I said, about not just uh, looking at text in isolation, but looking at it in tandem with metadata. So we really want to put the metadata, which of course is hard won in a lot of map collections uh, and sometimes doesn't even exist. So where we've got it, we're really excited to work with it. In the Rumsey collection, we can see, for example, uh, that if we search for Chicago, um, it's really interesting to realize how many maps, of course, uh, contain the word Chicago that are not covering the city of Chicago. Um, and that's a really interesting research question. Uh, so how many attestations of Chicago are not on maps of Chicago? In other words, 
which place names are reused and in what kinds of contexts outside of their initial context. Now here, of course, Chicago is gonna be all over the place talking about railway lines. And, and this is one of the things that, you know, it's a it's a kind of afterthought, right? Where we can see this data, but we, we can imagine that understanding the relationship between uh, sort of the reprinting of, of, of Chicago and the recognition of Chicago as something that's not just a city, but a railway line also comes back to this question of being able to identify the semantic type of um, of text on maps. Um, because I'm a historian of 18th century France, I can't help myself to do a search for Paris. So in the David Rumsey uh, collection, there are 14,024 mentions of Paris uh, in the collection. Uh, and this is a, a just a simple plot to show you um, how many of them occur over time. And so we can see that they really peak in the 17th, uh, 1870s uh, and, and 80s. Uh, and, and then we can plot these uh, on the earth. Now, what are we looking at here? As you might imagine, given the earlier map that we looked at where we can we know that there's lots of things that are sort of in a place that is not necessarily the geolocation of, of, a, of a place name, but perhaps representing something else. So we can pick an example of, of an attestation of Paris uh, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, which is in a, a sheet uh, in a world atlas that's uh, for a map of South America, where in the map, we can see uh, uh, that we're getting a description of of, of basically the, the longitude, right? <laughs> uh, and that this is where the mention of Paris is coming in. So again, semantic type uh, playing a huge role here, but it also allows us to really, I think, you know, related to the Chicago question, to investigate ways that place names are used in unexpected or perhaps surprising places on maps. Uh, and that place is something that's not just associated with naming uh, of cities, but also with scientific practices or, um, or industrialization and things like this. So the last thing I wanna talk about is how we really want to kind of connect text on maps to other kinds of information on maps. So um, if we think about uh, computational research using digitized maps as data, as a, as a really kind of uh, emerging field, there's a, a number of teams working on, on methods for thinking computationally with map collections. Uh, Text on maps, uh, you know, as Edney has said, uh, is really only one facet of, of maps. And we want to think about ways to kind of critically uh, uh, connect text on maps to other information. Now, for, for my own work and for the work that I've been doing with colleagues on living with machines, one of the things that we are planning to do uh, is to connect text on ordnance survey maps uh, to information that we have about the presence of railway infrastructure. So on the right here, you can see a visualization that basically is showing uh, in the kind of um, yellow, red, orange lines here, these are streets uh, and the darker the color, the, the more red the color uh, we can see uh, here in the city of Leeds means that these are streets that are close to very dense rail infrastructure. Now, if we could overlay uh, the text on maps data on top of this, then we would be able to, to be able to say more about the nature of industrial, commercial, residential, or civic uh, places, which are named on maps, in relation to rail infrastructure and these, um, and these streets uh, in, in Leeds and across the UK, and to really think about the patterns uh, of the uh, sort of arrival of rail and the impact of industrial uh, infrastructure in communities in the UK in ways that we've never really been able to do before. Um, so uh, we're excited to combine machine-generated data at scale uh, for different kinds of information to really do new historical research. All right, so I'm gonna wrap up here uh, by talking about just a few of the practical challenges and, and some next steps. So I've mentioned some of these already, um, but the first is really that a lot of maps are not geo-referenced. And uh, while it's entirely possible to work with non-geo-referenced collections, the, the Library of Congress collection is 
uh, currently mostly ungeo-referenced, although if you're interested in that, and I'm sure many of you have seen the great work that Adam Cox has been doing to, to geo-reference Sanborn maps, um, there's, there's really a, a gap there. So if we're thinking about working with text on maps as geospatial data, we really need those maps to be geo-referenced. I also just want to highlight the, the work um, that, that Bert Spahn and the IIIF for Maps group have been doing to really sort of it's going to be a game changer, as I'm sure a lot of you know, for, for creating um, opportunities for people to, to geo-reference maps, um, save that metadata, and potentially kind of uh, for libraries uh, uh, to pull that metadata back in, like the Leventhal Map Center is now doing in, in Boston uh, in collaboration uh, with BERT and, and all maps. The next thing is, of course, we would need to think really critically about entity linking. What are we linking to? Um, do we have historical gazetteers for particular places? Do we want to use larger kind of contemporary get, uh, sort of knowledge bases like OpenStreetMaps or, or Wikidata? What are the pros and cons of those? That's really going to depend on the collection that you're processing. The next thing, as you can see here uh, in the kind of example of uh, map curator output for one of the Sanborn sheets, is we have this challenge of figuring out how to group text not just to group text across, say, a phrase like Minneapolis and Northern Elevator Company, but also to envision grouping text as it's associated with another kind of entity on the map. So understanding that all of this text is related to the building footprints that it, it overlaps with or, or is adjacent to. The next thing we're interested in, as I've talked about a few times, is automatically predicting semantic type based on a kind of few basic semantic types, uh, like the the ones in the in the tree that I showed you earlier. And then finally, of course, it's really important to say that this method is not uh, sort of um, map style agnostic. Uh, map curator and the text spotting. Uh, methods that the Minnesota team has developed work really well. Uh, for maps in, in modern uh, languages and particularly in, in English uh, on maps that were created sort of from the 19th century onwards with that don't have very complicated sort of background textures. Um, and the results can also really vary uh, by scale. Uh, so there's a lot of scope for thinking about how we're uh, adapting these tools and making them really accessible for people who have quite distinctive collections. Um, the next thing we're really excited about is continuing to build community, really a kind of computational maps uh, community. And uh, for me, it's really important that that includes people from many disciplines. Uh, and it's not just, uh, shall we say, um, academics doing research projects, but really just deeply embedded in the library of the GLAM community. Uh, we want the kind of tools that are being created to be open source, sustainable, adaptable, and portable to other collections. Um, and we acknowledge that that's a huge amount of work, right? So we can't do that just with kind of, you know, depending on one grant um, and, and the next grant, right? We've really, we're really interested in building up a community uh, kind of triple IF style and thinking about how we can uh, create a sort of novel ways for thinking about the maintenance and development of, of tools and data um, and analysis methods. We're really keen to continue preparing training materials, uh, both for researchers and for uh, GLAM professionals. And, and uh, Valeria has really been leading on this. Uh, there's a couple of tutorials that are up already, you know, for the annotation work on, um, on our GitHub repo. Um, I, I think we're we're most excited to continue working with a, a variety of experts for thinking about text processing and annotation for specific collections um, in, in the future. If you're interested in talking about that, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, and I think we're, we're keen to think about the ways that our workflow and toolkit should be or could be productively integrated with other services. For example, uh, there's a lot of obvious connections with Triple IF that, that we're exploring. Um, the main thing is that we want to really simplify uh, kind of uh, making it possible for people to select sample data, exporting it, and training researchers to work with text on maps data in the ways that I've been describing and combining it with other kinds of data sets. So in conclusion, map text is really a new world of text data that is also spatial data. 
Uh, first, we need robust methods for generating this data at scale, evaluating it, and analyzing it. Um, we also want it to play nicely with the small data, right? Because not all map collections are giant, and we really want to be able to think about maps across, across these scales. Machine 3D Maps has worked to develop uh, methods and test them on large map collections using historical case studies. Uh, so stay tuned for our publications. Uh, and if you're interested in testing any of these methods and the links that we provided aren't sufficient, please don't hesitate to get in touch. We're really excited to hear from you. Thank you. Katie, thanks so much for, for that um, really great presentation. There's a lot of... Um interest i'm sure among the other librarians in the audience and i'll invite them and and anyone else at this point to to add questions or comments um to the q a um one thing that i wanted to ask um you mentioned earlier in the presentation you kind of have an existing project related to researching antiquities in british maps and i was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that so we can kind of have a an example application to help us contextualize the way that you're using these pipelines for your own work sure thing um i'm i i'm just trying let me just see if in this slide deck i actually have um sorry my screen is doing there it is um doing funny things uh i do not but um I know I've got, well, sorry, I've just not got this. I'm just going to talk through it. All right. So the antiquities work is really exciting because it's um, an opportunity for us to explore a number of these avenues, which we haven't necessarily developed automatic methods for yet, but that um, it, it, it really gives us a chance to kind of have a deep exploration of the map curator results. So um, what I can show you is the uh, the data um, that uh, is, um, yeah, shows some of our georeferencing <laughs> issues. You can see um, maps off in the sea. That's not correct, obviously. Um, but we're working here uh, with um, the first edition 25 inch maps uh, for the Ordnance Survey for four counties, um, two counties in Scotland, two counties in England. In England, it's Wiltshire and Somerset. Uh, and you can see here, we're looking, you know, you can see this is a sheet. Um, and these 25 inch sheets haven't yet been geo referenced by the NLS. Uh, and so we've been kind of playing around with some estimates, uh, right, for kind of um, fake georeferencing, uh, batch georeferencing, just based on trying to kind of predict based on a number of pixels, removing the map color and, and then plotting them. Um, so we have data for about 5,000 maps. You can see we have all these polygons, which include text transcriptions inside of them. If I zoom in, I can um, click and see this is the text transcription for this polygon. Um, uh, the, the aim here is to link uh, the text from these maps as inferred by map curator models to modern data sets. So we have for, for Scotland, we have the Canmore data, which includes historical sites, archaeological sites, includes information about periodization, um, uh, references to scholarly works and uh, variant names and all kinds of other kinds of attributes. Uh, and for England, we have uh, somewhat similar information from local authority records um, and, and historic England. Uh, and we're really keen um, to, to really think through to what extent do, does the quality of the map reader, uh, map curator results allow us to do linking based on string matching, um, uh, given that our geospatial, you know, locations for these texts uh, polygons is not going to be um, super easy to link uh, with, say, the spatial uh, attributes of the Canmore or the or the English Heritage data. And this 
is a really good example of the challenges of working with non-geo reference maps. Uh, when we're working with the Rumsey uh, data, uh, it's a lot easier for us to, um, uh, you know, envision comparing it with other data sets because we've already we've got much more accurate labels. Now, the other thing it goes without saying is, of course, the the location of a label on a map is not the location of the thing that that label describes on the map. And, and so that's the other thing that we're gonna be exploring with the Canmore data is um, plotting the Canmore, I'm just gonna take this away now, plotting um, those modern locations of features, comparing them to the representation of those symbols or, or features on the, the first edition OS maps and and then comparing the distance to the, to the text label. That's all work that we're gonna have to do on a manual scale first. Right, and then that'll be a kind of prototype for saying, okay, here's a task that we want to, you know, have uh, automated uh, in the future. So that's the grant that we're writing uh, at the moment. Yeah, and I imagine if that is something that you can demonstrate is successful, you could think about doing this process in reverse to a certain extent. If you have a geo-referenced map or image um, with, you know, that is geo-referenced, and you say, well, I want to assign text to these features. Maybe there's a possibility of kind of mm -hmm. doing that in reverse. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of people out there working on object detection for historical maps. And, you know, that task is way more advanced uh, than text spotting um, or even sort of segmentation um, work. And the object detection task, which then we could associate with modern data sets is is going to be going to be a really important thing to do um, going forward. The thing about uh, the modern data that we're working with is that it is, of course, also historical. So, in, in a sense, there's there's a real archaeology <laughs> to understanding the nature of the relationship between, say, Canmore. Um, which sometimes the the record for this historical site that record exists in Canmore because it was printed on the map, you know, that we're, that we're investigating. So there's a really nice kind of history of collections story here as well um, that we're, yeah, it's true that we're, we're kind of starting out small uh, with some manual tests uh, and, um, and thinking about how we can work effectively with this data. Uh, but we're excited to to start scaling that up um, as soon as we can. Thank you. We have a comment that has come in that I want to use as a springboard for a question too. So the comment is, um, as a map cataloger and having seen a whole lot of people saying metadata is no longer necessary because of full text searching and now because they think chat GPT can do cataloging, this presentation has been delightful. I love seeing someone say that text searching and human-made metadata can make each other better and stronger. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I want to use that as a springboard to obviously, you know, these are really um, interesting and innovative tools that a lot of library professionals, map collection curators are going to be interested in. But those folks aren't going to have the benefit of the kind of d direct collaboration that the National Library of Scotland and the Library of Congress and 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 Stanford through the David Rumsey collection have had. So, can you talk a little bit about the 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 resources and and tools that you're gonna develop and how you envision folks being able to in libraries being able to use this um, on their own without the benefit of that collaboration? Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think that that is the big question, and it's some. I, I struggle sometimes because I feel like as a historian, I should I should sort of hunker down and just <laughs> just you know do the research with the data and the maps that we have and 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 I will do that. I'm excited to do that um, with Valeria and with with my other colleagues, but I'm also and and not just me, but I think the whole team we're really driven uh, by uh, a kind of vision of you know, breaking down this divide really between, oh, there's stuff that libraries need to do with data and there's stuff that researchers are doing with data. And I really, I, I really want, you know, of course, sometimes we need to sp speak and develop materials for specific audiences, but I'm, I'm really 
excited about where we're where we've gotten to with this project in bringing together librarians and historians to think about to show you know that there's interest from both of those communities in these tools and to help have that guide what we're going to do in terms of training um i don't i don't want to um i mean i can't promise anything right now but the next steps that we're envisioning are really uh, to continue working with libraries who also share an interest, not just in say, processing the, and exposing their own collections or having us do research on their collections, but thinking about how in working with their collections, we can also make a contribution or take steps towards making, um, making it more, making these uh, methods uh, more approachable for a variety of institutions with different kinds of resources, right? So um, I'm, uh, that, that, that's still very much open <laughs> for discussion. Uh, my, my kind of vision um, is that we not, don't try to kind of create one one uh, method to to just make it and make it super easy and say everyone's maps will work with this one method but really to uh, sort of sort of bring together upskilling you know a certain level um, creation of new models of collaboration across institutions and between researchers and institutions who may not even you know be us but researchers who who are keen to do this create models for that um and um and then obviously having tools that are then adaptable for people who are uh sort of put have put themselves in these kind of collaborative configurations or who have through some basic training materials that were provided understand what they don't know right they uh, can you can you get a grip on what expertise uh you need to bring in in order to accomplish something is it that you have a big collection in and it's not in english and you really need to think about what language models are you're using um is it is it a training data question right so different collections are going to have different challenges and i think what one of the things we're really trying to focus on is um, making sure that all of the choices that someone would need to make and the skills associated with understanding, you know, the answers <laughs> to those choices um, are something that we can help, if not, you know, develop guidance or tutorials ourselves. work with uh, other people to, to develop. So, I, you know, it's a, it's a work in progress, but I'm really excited about... Um, I'm really excited about the possibilities here of collaboration um, in a broader community. Um, I'm thinking that in the new year, we're going to uh, maybe try having a community call uh, for people who are interested in, you know, any of the of the machines reading maps sort of elements to come together and you know, begin this work, right, of thinking about what it means to, for this not just to be a, be a project with, um, you know, defined people, uh, who are on the original grant, but a larger community of people who can get involved. Great, great. We have uh, just a couple minutes left. I'm, and so I'm probably asking what could be the last question. Um, and you just mentioned language. And I'm wondering, has um, have has this pipeline been utilized on maps where uh, the language is in non-Roman characters? Um, and and if, if not, is that something that you're thinking about i'm thinking about in my head like the idea of being able to translate text by relating you know extracted text in non-roman characters to uh whatever corpus is developed that that could associate that information yeah no that's that's uh yes the answer is yes for the rumsey collection and i think in one of the links i included a link to the um to the text spotting uh the map curator models which uh are, are not language specific but are um script sort of script specific um that's probably a good question to ask uh the minnesota colleagues about later if there's time 
in terms of the ways that they've been um, grouping languages. Uh, but we, I think there's, uh, as I'm sure they would, they would, uh, agree, there's a, a long road ahead, right. In thinking about how we, how we address this. And at the moment, yeah, there is a bit of a, of a barrier, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, okay, I've got a large enough map collection that it, first of all, it makes sense to do this, uh, inference as opposed to just a really kind of carefully thought out and perhaps slightly longer uh, manual annotation task. Um, all right, I've got a large enough collection. It's in a language that, um, it's in a language that, uh, uh, you know, we don't have uh, sort of any training data already for. Uh, we need to create training data. Right now, it's not possible to use uh, the manual annotations as training data. And uh, this is something that I think is really crucial, particularly for working with lower resource languages and really anything uh, that hasn't been explored yet. Uh, but yeah, as in computational linguistics, the language question is is really, really crucial. And I don't want to pretend like the results are the same across across languages and time. Thank you so much for this presentation. This has been great. Um, we have a very short break uh, and then we'll start our um, next session at 1120 Eastern, 1020 Central. So please everyone join me in thanking Katie. This was a great presentation. We really appreciate it. Thank you.